this foundational section, we'll break down the resume into its key parts, and later on we'll get more advanced. In your workbook, write down the answers to this question. What are the key pieces of information that you think should be included in a resume? You may want to pause this video while you write down your answers. Let's start answering that question together. These answers are already listed in the workbook for you. I'll start by highlighting the key components of a resume, and then we'll go over each section in more depth. So first and foremost, your resume needs your contact information, so potential employers know how to get in touch with you. You'd be amazed how many people forget this or mess this up. Then an objective, and this is a point of controversy in the HR world, and we'll get into that shortly. Next, your profile and summary of skills. Of course, your professional work experience, and you should also include any awards or recognition that you've received. After all, not everyone receives accolades. It's also important to include your education and training background too. These next two components are optional. Your community involvement or professional affiliations and associations. You may even want to include your hobbies under the right circumstances. And the last part is another point of controversy in the HR space. I'll go over the pros and cons of including your photograph on your resume. We'll begin with a deep dive on contact information. There's a lot to be said about this small section. A big mistake people make with their resumes is to only include their contact information on the first page. If your resume has two pages, and the maximum should be two pages, it's important that your contact information is on both of those pages. It's also helpful if your page numbers are listed as page one of two or page two of two. Why? The pages can get separated. Recruiters don't usually print one resume at a time, they print in batches. And if a batch of 100 resumes is sent to a printer, it's easy for them to fall off the printer and onto the floor into a crazy mess. Don't ask me how I know this. Your two pages can get separated from each other, so each page should provide information about how the hiring manager can get in touch with you. Here's another tip regarding contact information. If your goal is to change companies, please do not use your work telephone number or emails from your current employer on your resume. It makes you look unprofessional. If a hiring manager sees that you're taking care of personal matters while at work for somebody else, they're going to assume that you'll do the same thing if you work for them. Also, make sure that you avoid using inappropriate and unprofessional email addresses. I've seen email addresses like Sexy Mama or Mr. Lucky on resumes, and those applicants don't even get considered. Also, using old-school email providers like AOL is risky, especially if you're in the IT space. This can show that you're not comfortable with new technologies. If you don't yet have an email address that reflects your professionalism, it's easy to set one up through Google's Gmail or Yahoo's Ymail. Finally, make sure you include your public and personalized LinkedIn address. If you're not familiar with LinkedIn, it's a social networking site for professionals, and more than 60% of recruiters have said that they're using this platform as the primary place to source their candidates. You can get a basic account for free. I've included a snapshot of my LinkedIn profile so you can see exactly where my LinkedIn URL is located. Just copy and paste your LinkedIn address into your resume, which makes it that much easier for recruiters and hiring managers to learn more about you and why you're the best candidate for the position. One final tip here. Once you finish your resume, you can copy and paste the, that information into your LinkedIn profile, even the bullets themselves. To objectify or not to objectify? That is the question. All right, let's talk about objectives. Recently, they've become a point of discussion in the HR space. Some recruiters are advising people to stop putting objectives on their resumes. And I think that's because most objectives are poorly written. Objectives aren't well received when they only come from the perspective of the applicant. Essentially, these bad objectives can be summarized into this generic goal. I want a job. No kidding. As we've discussed, recruiters spend about six seconds reviewing a resume before deciding if it goes into the A pile or the B pile. And you need to ask yourself if you want those six seconds spent on your objective. Objectives are subjective. Beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Personally, I'm a fan of objectives, if they're written correctly and if you're taking a new turn in your career. Your objectives should specify either the industry, company, or position that you're targeting. It should be really specific, succinct, meaningful, and memorable. 
you should be able to state your objective verbally without having to read it. It's essentially a written version of your enticing elevator speech. And if you're going to change your resume for each position you're pursuing, this is where you can customize things. Even if you decide not to include an objective on your resume, the act of writing an objective just for yourself can help you get clear on what you're looking for in your next role or employer. Objectives are particularly helpful when you want to start or change careers because your work or school history may not align with your future employment goals. Objectives are essential for functional resumes, more about those later on. And finally, the trick is to write an objective that's not all about you. Your objective should talk about what's in it for the hiring manager if he or she employs you. So let's review some examples to show you what I mean. You'll see these same examples of objectives in your workbook. So what does the employer get in this first objective? They get the opportunity to train someone who's a newbie. This particular objective is all about the employee. You knew exactly what you wanted, by the way. But what do they gain in this second example? It's about the employee and the employer. And you can see the employer gets leadership experience and customer service skills. What does the employer receive with this third objective? They get a coach. Good managers are also good coaches. The employer also gets someone who's passionate about the sports industry. Have you ever been around someone who loves what they do? It's contagious, right? And inspiring to be around. Let's look at this new set of objectives. The first one shows that this person is highly educated. She has a higher education, so should be a critical thinker. The next one makes it clear that this person isn't interested in being a manager right now. If the employer's top heavy and has too many managers, they might welcome more individual contributors. And this third one is the simplest. It quickly says, you're an experienced IT programmer and you're seeking only senior IT programmer positions. So don't get caught up thinking that objectives have to be long and fancy. The key thing to keep in mind is that a clever objective conveys your goals along with some benefits to the employer who's considering hiring you. Moving on to the profile section. Profiles are particularly helpful if you have at least 10 years of work experience. Let me ask you a question. What do you think hiring managers wanna see in this area? If you said skills or competencies or characteristics, you're right. This section should grab the reader's attention and act as the preview of the good things to come if they were to hire you. Once you've written your two to three lines that summarize your work history, feel free to add some bullets. For those of you who like to tailor your resume for a specific position, these bullet points are an easy area to update with keywords related to a particular position. If you look at the third bullet on this slide, it divides skills and competencies into two major categories, industry-specific and transferable. Industry skills are exactly like that sounds, skills that are unique to a specific field. But transferable skills are skills that are useful no matter what industry you're in. In the workbook, let's look at the pages that cover transferable skills. Take a few minutes to review the list and circle the skills that you have proficiency with. If you see several skills in the same grouping, the heading above that is the corresponding higher level transferable skill. For example, if you circled explaining, proofreading, and telling, then you can put a star next to communication, which is the transferable skill associated with that grouping. You probably need to pause the video to go through this exercise. One mistake that job seekers make is making the summary section focus exclusively on their technical skills. However, employers want people who are highly skilled and who get along well with others. So it's important to also include some of your interpersonal skills too. To help you with that, in your workbook, look at the personal characteristics section and circle words that describe you and your personality at work. You may have a great sense of humor and comedic timing, but unless you're applying for a job as a comedian, that probably shouldn't be included in your profile. You can, however, include words like enthusiastic, creative, energetic, inquisitive, and personable. It may take you a few minutes to review this list. And once you finish, go back through the list and then circle your top three. Those are the traits that you should include in your profile. If you need to pause this video while you go through this exercise, feel free. Finally, let's look at the last bullet on this slide. Languages are an easy way to stand out from the crowd. 
If you speak more than one language, please showcase that on your resume. It's a global workforce today and organizations need people who can successfully navigate and communicate in global environments. Following are some examples of how summaries can be written. I won't read these to you, so check out these four slides at your own pace. Here's a tidbit of secret sauce for you. If you've developed a particular specialty, your summary title can reflect that niche. For example, if you're a risk management executive in the banking space and you want to continue in that vein, you can let potential employers know that your specialty is being a financial services risk management executive. If you work in the automotive industry as an IT project manager, you can summarize that by describing yourself as an automotive technology project manager. If you have a history of selling in the CPG space, you can let employers know that that's your niche by calling yourself a consumer packaged goods sales representative. One more thing, if you're changing careers, feel free to include both an objective and a summary on your resume. That helps people understand both where you've been and where you wanna go next. Here are a couple of examples for you to look at. Moving on to your work history. This slide shows what should be concluded in your professional experience section. It's helpful to have the industry in parentheses after the organization name. There are some interviewers who may not be familiar with the organization that you are currently employed by. For example, when I first moved to Charlotte, I kept seeing signs for this company called Wachovia. Being new to town, I had no idea that it was a bank. Most of the other items on this slide are self-explanatory. So I want to draw your attention to the last bullet because this is the game changer. To stand out from the thousands of other job applicants, it's vital that you include your key accomplishments and that they're measurable. More about that soon. And here's a tip for you. If you've had more than one role at a company, include your title and achievements for each position. Companies like to see career progression. Here's some more secret sauce. If you really wanna drive home all the experience you've acquired with your specialty, try this tip. Instead of using the phrase work experience or professional experience, give this section a niche header. For example, if you have a strong history of selling in the pharmaceutical space, replace the phrase professional experience with pharmaceutical sales experience. It just reinforces your brand. Okay, superstar. Let's zero in on the awards and recognition that you've received and why you've received all those accolades. This slide shows some examples of employee recognition that can be included on your resume. Employee of the Month for Superior Customer Service. Nurse of the Year for Excellent Patient Care. Award of Excellence for Outstanding Performance and Business Impact. White Paper Published in the American Medical Journal. I can't think of any employer out there who wouldn't want to work with someone who's talented enough to win awards with all their hard work. Now for one of my favorite sections, education and training. I love teaching, so that shouldn't be surprising. In your workbook, write down the information that you think should be included in the education and training section. For your formal education, you want to include the name and location of the college or the university that you went to. If you've already earned your degree, you can include the year that you completed the curriculum. If you're concerned about age discrimination, though, then simply don't include the year. If you're still in school, you can say you're pursuing the degree or indicate the date that you anticipate graduating. 
you may or may not want to include your GPA. If your grade point average helps tell a positive story about you, then why not list it? And if your emphasis was more on the extracurricular activities than your classroom studies, you may not want to include it. Either way, be consistent. If you've attended two different schools, either include the GPA for both or don't include the GPA for both. Inconsistencies can be a red flag for employers. Here's a question that comes up a lot. What do you do if you started going to college but you didn't finish earning your degree? I've got you covered. You can simply put the name of the school, the city it's located in, if you declared a major you can list the degree that you were pursuing, and here's the biggie, leave the dates open. Look at the example on this slide. You can see this person started their degree in 2004 and because the dates are left open, it's clear he or she didn't finish. If you want to make it crystal clear, you can even say degree not completed, but that's not really necessary. If you've successfully participated in relevant professional development training classes, then you may want to include them too. Did you earn your PMP or Project Management Professional designation? If so, list it. How about your Series 7 license? Include it. Employers really value people who learn. In fact, here's one of my favorite quotes from futurist Alvin Toffler. The illiterate of the 21st century won't be those who can't read or write, but those who can't learn, unlearn, and relearn. Whenever you've invested in certifications or other professional development opportunities, be sure to include them on your resume. The ability to learn, unlearn, and relearn is a lifelong skill in and of itself and helps you hone your problem-solving skills. Here are two examples of ways that you can include education and training on your resume. I won't read them to you, so just check them out at your own pace. One last tip in this area. If you're a fairly new graduate, place the education information at the top of your resume. But if you have some work history, place your professional experience information at the top and education at the bottom. Moving on to your professional affiliations. Just like people like to do business with companies that are socially responsible, employers also appreciate people who are actively involved in the community. There are lots of examples of professional organizations that you may belong to, so you can keep current in your field. For example, the American Society for Training and Development, or the Public Relations Society of America, or the Project Management Institute, and the list goes on. You might also be a really active volunteer member of a political organization. Consider the risks and rewards of including any political organizations on your resume. It can help ingratiate you with like-minded hiring managers, However, it can also cause you to be excluded by a potential employer who doesn't share your political beliefs. The next thing you may want to consider including on your resume is your hobbies. If you've just graduated from school and your work history is limited and your resume looks like a blank sheet of paper, it might be helpful to include some hobbies so that interviewers can have some way to connect with you. I once spent about 15 minutes of a 30-minute interview discussing our mutual love of scuba diving with the hiring manager. However, if you are more seasoned and your resume is quite full, hobbies are an easy section to eliminate because they're not work-related. One last point here. If you choose to include hobbies, make sure that they're activities that don't scare people, like knife collecting. I'm just saying. The last item in this section is photographs. Should you? Or shouldn't you? Some parts of the world require photos, and if you send in a resume without a picture, you won't even be considered for the position. And there are some other valid reasons for including a picture of yourself on your resume. You might be an actor or a model or in a profession that has this as an industry requirement. Keep in mind that a photograph differentiates you and makes you more memorable. And more than 50% of employers check your social media presence before they call you for an interview. So they're gonna see your photos anyway, and you might as well make it a professional one. By the way, you may wanna Google yourself so that you can see what an employer will see when they Google you. There are also valid reasons not to include a photo on your resume. It's not a requirement in the USA at this time. And please forgive my bluntness here, but you might not photograph well. 
And some more reasons that you may not want to include a photo on your resume are the fact that unprofessional photos convey unprofessionalism. This isn't the place for a selfie. Just as beauty's in the eye of the beholder, photos may trigger a bias in the eye of the beholder. And finally, the technology may not handle the image well. Most ATSs are still not designed to handle graphics. If you do decide to include a photo on your resume, follow these tips to show your best self. Hire a professional photographer. This isn't the place for a photo from your cousin Susie. Get your hair cut and if necessary colored at least a week in advance. Drink lots of water so that your skin looks terrific. Dress like the professional that you really are and get a good night's sleep so that you look really well rested. Phew, that was a big module. Kudos to you for sticking with it. Now that we've got the basics down, in the next module, we'll cover some higher level secrets.